Good morning to everyone. My name is Bishop Daniel Muggenberg, and I serve as one of the auxiliary bishops in the Archdiocese of Seattle, along with Bishop uh, Elizondo. And uh, Bishop Elizondo and I are very pleased to be with you, especially for these liturgies, and to extend to you Archbishop Sarton's presence and an assurance of his prayers. So please know that the Archbishop is very much praying for the success of your meetings these days, and by the presence of Bishop Elizondo and myself, he is also with you today as well. And I also want to recognize and thank Bishop Silver for joining uh, in this gathering, and uh, all of the priests and deacons who have come to be present. This is my first opportunity to be with a Curcio group uh, as you have your reunion and your meetings, and already I am very impressed and encouraged by the spirit that is so evidently present among you. And so I encourage you to keep that fire burning and to find ways to share and spread that fire with others. Our gospel today presents a teaching of Jesus that isn't just about marriage and divorce. It's something that is applicable to so many areas of our lives of discipleship. And yet I think it's important to look carefully at this gospel reading so that we can find those principles that will help us navigate other situations of life as well. One of the first things to point out about this particular gospel reading is that the people who approached Jesus with the question were testing him. Now that means that they were not so much interested in what he had to say, rather they were looking for something by which they could trap him. It's important to remember that John the Baptist had been beheaded because of what he had said about marriage, especially Herod's marriage. And now Jesus is being put to the test to see what he will say. And with every intention of turning him into Herod, they anxiously await his answer. But what Jesus does in this moment of testing is he sees it as an opportunity to help other people understand God's will for their lives in a beautiful and appealing way. Now that is, first of all, a great instruction for all of us. How many of you ever feel like you are being tested by questions that are posed to you in the office, in the family, even in the church? It's important that we have eyes like Jesus had eyes to recognize in every situation an opportunity to speak the good news of God's word. And even a situation of being tested is an open door that we should not shy away from, but we should be bold, courageous, and faithful in responding to. In the particular question posed to Jesus, they ask about divorce in the ancient world. Now in order for us to understand the context in which Jesus responds to this question and what he is trying to teach us, we need to understand how various groups in the time of Jesus would have responded to that question. Some groups, like the Essenes, did prohibit divorce, but the vast majority of Jewish groups actually had a very permissive attitude towards it. The Rabbi Hillel taught that a man could divorce his wife if she so much as burned his dinner. Can you imagine? The Rabbi Akiva taught that a man could be permitted to divorce if he found another woman more beautiful. I say these things because it gives us an idea 
of the world in which Jesus lived. And even in the pagan Roman world, Seneca observed that divorce was so pervasive that people would actually leave home in order to marry and marry for the sole sake of divorce. That simply allows us to understand the culture in which Jesus gave his teaching. I would dare say that Jesus' teaching that we just heard in the gospel was more radical in the first century than it is today. And what Jesus does in this gospel is he first of all speaks to the disciples who ask a question about Moses, about Moses commanding the writing of a decree. And Jesus clarifies their statement, and he also corrects that statement. He helps them understand that Moses permitted it because of their hardness of heart and not in witness to the divine will. Now that's a very important distinction, and it's the first thing that Jesus wants to teach us about how to approach every situation in our lives today. You see, rather than settling for what the culture around us accepts, or what the culture around us promotes, or rather than settling what we experience because of human weakness, our first goal should always be to ask the question, what does God intend? What does God hope for? And that ideal, that value of faith, is what should first and foremost inspire us and inform us for every issue, not just this one. And that's why this situation can teach us how to approach life in general. So think about for a moment all of the situations that we face. Jesus is giving us an important insight into how we are to act in those circumstances. Rather than responding in a way that conforms to the practices around us, or settling for what is permissible according to society, as disciples, Jesus wants us to strive to fulfill in all things the ultimate will of God from the beginning before the introduction of sin, before the fall. The reality is that the presence of sin always weakens our ability to fully live out God's will for our lives. But the grace of Christ has the power to sustain us even in our weakness, as St. Paul teaches. So our starting point for seeking resolution to any issue that we face any day of our lives should always be in the original will of God, the original hope of God. It's only when we strive to fulfill God's will in its fullness and originality that we can hope to live as faithful disciples and be inspired and guided through the stormy waters of human weakness. That's a powerful statement. Humanity, divided by sin, can become united with the grace of Christ, which overcomes all things. It's a powerful message not only for our marriages, but for every issue that we face in family life, professional life, and personal life. 
And the final thing that Jesus teaches us in this passage occurs when the Lord states, what God has joined together, let no man separate. You see, that statement is reminding us as Christian disciples that marriage is to be primarily understood as a manifestation of divine will and not as mere human decision or mere human selection. Now, that's true not just of marriage, but of every circumstance that God allows us to be in in life. The Lord has put us there for a reason. And that reason is to do His will, not our will. And if we're not praying and discerning what is the will of God for a particular situation, then we will never understand that it's God's work that we're called to do and not our work. Going back to the teaching of Jesus, what makes the marriage between two Christians unique and distinct is that they share in a supernatural bond not just a natural bond. The marriage of Christians is the fulfillment and manifestation of God's will for two people. And so Christian marriage is not so much based on human selection of a spouse, but on human participation in and discernment of God's selection of a spouse. And it's for that reason the Christian life is both a vocation and a sacrament in marriage. In Christian marriage, the couple is called by God to manifest the very self-giving, creative, redemptive, sanctifying, and sacrificial love of Jesus in their lives with one another. And in doing so, the couple themselves become the ministers of the sacrament of Jesus' presence to one another as the love Jesus has for the church is mirrored in their lives. The permanence of marriage is not based on the strength of the couple's commitment, but on the unchanging will of God who destined the spouses for each other. That's a powerful teaching on marriage, certainly. But it's also a powerful teaching on how we are called to approach all of our questions and situations and decisions. First, don't settle for the minimum. Don't aspire to the minimum. Don't conform your lives to the culture and the world around you. What is permitted is not always what God intends. Seek first God's intention. Seek it in prayer. Seek it in the lives of holy men and women who have lived it so heroically. Seek it for every situation, not just this one. And secondly, follow God's will before our will. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Thy will be done, Thy kingdom come. That's when we ask God the question, Lord, how is it that you are wanting me to participate in your work today, in this moment, in this decision, in this situation that I face? Because if we're not asking that question, what is God's work that he wants to accomplish and how can we participate in it? If we're not asking that question, then it will always be our work, 
our decision, our intention. And if the Lord isn't the one who's building the house, in vain are the, build, are, are the, are, are the, are the builders laboring. So may this teaching that Jesus gives us on the dignity, the beauty of Christian marriage, inspire us in all of our circumstances, certainly in our marriages, but in our Christian life in general.